Hello, and welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast, where it is my job to discuss democratic institutions. In today's episode, I discuss several principles of direct democracy, together with my guest, Stefan Schlegel. About two years ago, Stefan Schlegel and myself wrote a blog post titled Eight Principles of Direct Democracy, published on the Center for Global Development blog. In that piece, we describe and discuss principles that make the use of direct democracy less controversial, less risky, more cohesive and not least more democratic. Today we want to resume that discussion. Direct democracy can be described as the people's branch of government. It is indeed a very powerful democratic institution that has to be used with care and caution. But used in the right way, it can be an important check on representative democracy. It is rather a complement to other democratic institutions than a substitute. Direct democracy is the people's veto power in government. It is a way to break politicians and parties' coalitions directed against the common interest of the voters and a way to hedge against excessive politics by elected representatives. Based on the examples of the Brexit referendum and the recent Swiss popular initiative to ban face veils, that is a ban on burqas, we debate some of the biggest problems and possible solutions when using direct democracy. Stefan Schlegel is a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer at the law faculty of the University of Bern in Switzerland. He holds a PhD in law and specializes in studies of refugee and immigration law. He is an Ambizione Fellow of the Swiss National Science Foundation. Previously, Stefan Schlegel was a Senior Research Fellow at the Max Planck Institute for the study of ethnic and religious diversity in Germany. Besides his academic career, he is a member of the board at Operation Libero, an influential liberal transpartisan political movement that is much engaged in campaigns around popular votes in Switzerland. Furthermore, Stefan is an active member and contributor to various political organizations in Switzerland. If you'd like to connect with Stefan, you can find him on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I'll link to both accounts, to some of his written articles and to his website, in the show notes. I am your host, Stefan Kybertz, and this is the fifth episode in my podcast, The Rules of the Game, where I discuss, analyze, and compare democratic institutions from around the world. I am a political economist with a PhD in economics from the University of Bern in Switzerland, and I previously held positions at the London School of Economics and Political Science and the Center for Global Development. Please subscribe to this podcast on your preferred podcast platform, and you'll always get the latest episode. A great way to support my work is to leave a review. You can find me on Twitter, And you can find show notes with links to all material discussed on my website, rulesofthegame.blog. Now, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Stefan Schlegel. Stefan Schlegel, welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast. Very happy to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Now, as usually, I want to introduce um, the episode with uh, a bit of your personal background with regard to democracy, so that people have a bit of an idea of, you know, what's your motivation and um, why are you so engaged in democratic questions? So what is your first memory of democracy? I think I do have memories very early childhood memories of the overthrow of the Ceausescu regime in Romania and of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, a friend of mine in kindergarten brought, brought the, 
a piece of the Berlin Wall that left an impression um, on me. And then I think a bit later in, in 1992, uh, I realized that there was an epic uh, democratic debate going on in Switzerland, uh, which was, of course, the question whether Switzerland should join uh, the European um, Economic Association. And I remember sort of having very early um, childhood political debates in the locker room with classmates and stuff. And classmates would say, well, we should reject that proposal, otherwise there would be even more people coming over here from Yugoslavia. And I, I thought that that was not a a really valid argument and, and without having any background in it, I sort of started being in, interested in questions like that. All right, cool. So as I know you, you probably won the argument. <laughs> so, and and then when did you become like uh, politically active and in what position was that? I first was intrigued, I think, through, um, by immigration, um, politics, migration ethics, uh, um, the, the struggle for the rights of, of refugees, which always has a peculiar relationship to uh, questions of democracy because it's sort of the, the control group, right? It's, you can study sort of what happens to the rights of people who have no voice within a uh, democratic um, system. So that was uh, in the early 2000s um, and for a long time I didn't have a formal or a formalized political position. I, I never found the idea particularly attractive to join a political party. And so for a long time I was sort of free floating and it was really the ban on minarets in 2009. So again, a di uh, an issue in direct democracy, uh, a, a popular initiative that um, won rather surprisingly that sort of um, created an urge among many people like me who were uh, free-floating to, um, uh, to organize uh, and to, um, you know, to, to bundle their, their forces and to, to do something about it. Mm, right. And um, as I know, you then started like a, a, a political movement, which pretty much specifically was... Um, an answer to, to important popular initiatives in Switzerland that were lost uh, from, uh, from, um, from your perspective. And this movement gained quite a lot of steam, so that, that became like an important player in, the, in civil society in Switzerland. Uh, and that is quite remarkable, and we will get back to that maybe a bit later. Now, two years ago, um, we, I asked you whether you would be interested in co-writing, co-authoring uh, a blog post about principles of direct democracy. And I remember you were very much um, motivated. You, you immediately said, yeah, that's, that's a good idea because as, as it is, we probably often talk about or people talk about uh, the results or the outcomes of direct democracy but rarely about how they evolve or what are the underlying rules that guide these initiatives or, or referendums and that's exactly what we're going to do now we want to talk about the institution uh, of direct democracy and what are important aspects of it, what are important rules or principles, as we call them, that make demo direct democracy uh, a more reliable tool and, and also how it complements uh, other democratic institutions. So from, from your perspective, why do you think is, or direct democracy, is, is, it seems a powerful tool because it, uh, a decision taken by uh, a population in a country like a, uh, by the by the electorate is is kind of a, a, a like a final decision it, it usually is taken as as an important um, uh, decision making mechanism so why do you think what, what what makes direct democracy so powerful there are several um, 
reasons why I think um, direct democracy is something worthwhile to defend and something worthwhile to um, sort of lobby for uh, in places where it does not yet exist or where it has a merely marginal um, existence. The most important reason, and that's not yet a very you know, powerful institutional argument, is, I think, that direct democracy is a constant reminder and a very healthy reminder that civilization is built on thin ice, um, that human rights, the separation of power, uh, the defense of human dignity is something that is not a given, not by... Um, a long shot, but something that has to be um, uh, reconquered, redefended, generation by um, generation. So, sort of the the anti thesis to direct democracy would sort of be the German Grundgesetz, uh, the German constitution that says, well, certain principles like federalism and certain rights um, are beyond deliberation from now on they shall never be reconsidered again a, a, a clause of eternity uh, which can be a very dangerous self deception like believing that those things never have to be fought for again because they're sort of one once and for all and Direct democracy is a constant and a powerful reminder that that is not the case and that um, especially human rights are, are something that are not just a given but something that has, has to be, you know, groomed, uh, um, uh, uh, developed, improved, extended uh, for generations um, to come. So a constitution, um, a... A social contract, if you want, um, becomes much more something that you did not, you know, um, is not heritated from your parents, but sort of lent from your children, and and you have a, you know, you have a task there defending it and improving it. Right, and um, also I think what what few people know, or that actually most countries. Um, around the world at some point had a direct democratic decision. So it is not the case that it's um, not used. It's used in, or has at some point been used in most countries. So it's really important to actually talk about how it is used and, and what, are, what are the underlying rules. And I think um, as we see in Switzerland, how it works, as a almost like a, a another branch of government in some sense because it's an important check on on the legislative branch so it's a kind of almost like a, a steering wheel or a correction mechanism of of the legis or the representative branch of government uh, how how do you kind of see that that coexistence between the legislative branch and direct democracy yeah, so here are two very important distinctions. One is, I think, direct democracy in a context where it is used very occasionally, sort of to, you know, um, vote on a new constitution, for instance, or um, for the pouvoir constituant um, rather than for the um, pouvoir constitué, sort of the, 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 the body of power that would create and legitimize a constitution rather than, you know, as a um, sort of a step in legislature that can draw um, the power of the of the legislative branch towards itself and 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 say no that is so important we as a people want um, to um, decide about it once you make that step so from a very occasional use very exceptional use of direct democracy to a regular use. Like in Switzerland, where you have like basically four Sundays a year, where you have several proposals that are voted on, um, both on the constitutional and on the statutory level, and then more stuff on a regional and 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 municipal level. Uh, once you you make that step, I think um, direct democracy sort of morphs its function, and it um, becomes an even more powerful tool in moderating and guiding 
uh, the legislative branch, even in cases where no one even raises the threat of taking, uh, you know, recourse to a referendum, merely because the threat of a referendum is out there. So, if we talk about direct democracy, we tend to highlight, you know, specific issues that were highly emotional, that might have had problematic results, uh, that are, you know, uh, criticized internationally. But that is sort of just the dark underbelly of direct democracy. What makes it such a powerful and such a useful and such a moderating tool is the constant threat to its the, uh, legislative branch that it, what they deliberate might be struck down if they aren't struggling for moderation and for compromise as it is deliberated um, in Parliament. So it has a uh, at least in its function as a brake. Uh, we might discuss the, 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 the function as a steering wheel so where amendments can be formulated um, by uh, the people themselves. That might have a different function and that might actually lead the legislative branch astray and sort of um, giving in to that temptation to you know, highlight topics um, that are populist or that are uh, overblown, sort of just to respond to the concerns um, of the people. So the two, you know, basically different types of direct democracy as they are used in Switzerland might have different um, a different impacts on, on how the legislative branch um, behaves. But at least as long as it works as a break, it has a strongly moderating um, influence. And that in and of itself is something very valuable, I think. Mm. Yeah, so also as we discuss in that, in that um, blog post that we published um, on the Center for Global Development uh, blog, uh, we we make or we we mainly or we discuss the the the, the referendum on, on on one side and the initiative right on the other side and how we um, describe them is for the initiative as a steering wheel right because the people among the population can take up a completely new political issue that hasn't been on stage in parliament and they can kind of create that uh, discussion around uh, a popular initiative and clearly change course in a specific uh, political issue. While the referendum is, is a more a break because it, it, uh, it works in the sense that the parliament makes, creates a legislation and approves it and then the people have the possibility to say no, stop, that's not in our interest. That's mm. in the interest of maybe the parliament as a specific group or like as the representative body, but the, the opinion uh, might still be different among the population, right? Mm. So that's clearly the difference between the steering wheel and kind of the brake mm -hmm. as, as, as we discuss it. Can I throw in an example how this steering wheel might have, you know, different effects. Take this um, ban on burkas. It's not even a week old as we discussed that that so entered our constitution. Uh, it has been attempted to create a burka ban beforehand through the parliamentary way and that never um, succeeded. There was not a majority for a ban of burkas in parliament. But once the initiative was sort of ripe to be brought to the um, to the ballots, Parliament sort of entered into the debate and said, yeah, we might have an issue here. It's not that we want a burqa ban, but apparently there is a problem there, while the problem was very much, you know, created out of thin air. Um, so let's do something um, about it. And they sort of created a counter proposal, which is a, you know, um, a, an instrument that, that in an important way, um, flanks the rights to initiatives, so the, the, the possibility to create counter-proposals that might, in specific cases, be, uh, you know, um, put a referendum at the same day, so you have sort of two options from um, which to choose, um, and uh, they um, 
sort of led into temptation to create a, a counter proposal. Um, and, and there we might have a different and, and, and a more problematic effect of, of direct democracy as we see it in this moderating force that I tried to describe um, on, uh, on the... Um, on, on the level of that, um, um, the referendum in its nature as a break. Yeah, that's that's true. That's specific for for Switzerland. I think that kind of t um, the possibility of of a counter um, uh, proposal in that sense. And we will will come back to to the discussion um, of the burqa or the niqab ban. Um, that just uh, was approved by the Swiss population, actually, and we'll discuss it in connection with uh, the tyranny of the majority over over a minority, which is actually one of the very critical uh, issues around direct democracy. Mm -hmm. But now we will we we want to go back to the initial uh, motivation why we started putting these principles of direct democracy together. And that was actually the Brexit referendum. And from, from our perspective, we saw that uh, the Brexit referendum had several issues that we judge as being kind of in a inadequate application of direct democracy. Um, and, and the first one would be that it was a, a top-down referendum. So David Cameron at some point was under political pressure and he kind of thought of using that referendum also as a, um, a, a political tool for him to, to confirm him as a prime minister. And so he proposed that, that uh, referendum as a, as a top-down measure and essentially it was the conservative party that really you know um put it to the people and that um also was responsible for the timing right so it was um not an initiative coming from out of the people through like sig collecting signatures no it was the prime minister who had this idea and put it to people. What, and what's the problem with that? So I, I think really that this feature is sort of this, the, the, the most certain sign that something with direct democracy is deeply flawed if it is sort of the head of the state or the head of the government that can decide when the people shall have a vote and when not. First of all, it is, you know, from a from a point of view of political philosophy, it is clearly in ill um, ill conceived or not thought through, because who in such a system would be the sovereign? So, if you think of a sovereign power from which all legitimate political power flows, then it should be capable to say when it has a say and when it has not. So as long as the people rely on the goodwill and the good mood and the judgment that it might be a good timing now by a head of government or a parliament for that matter um, or a European com commission, you name it, um, to sort of grant them as a sovereign the vote, that clearly then they're not sovereign and one of the fundamental flaws, I think, of Brexit was that there is a very strong um, uh, doctrine in the UK that sovereignty lies with the parliament, and yet you introduce the people as, you know, a, a different source of power um, without clarifying, well, who ultimately is the sovereign, how do they, um, how is the relationship between the two and who can ultimately say who has a say and when. So at the very moment where it is not the, uh, the people themselves or a subset of that people who can actually enforce a referendum uh, to happen, um, direct democracy is deeply flawed. Um, Stemming from that problem is a problem that whenever 
you know, um, a head of government grants the, you know, by his grace, um, a vote to the people, then he or her has always second thoughts. Like uh, you described it with Cameron, so they want to, you know, free their back from backbenchers in their own party or from a nasty opposition party. So they always pursue an agenda that is alien to the issue at hand. So there's always a mix-up of issues, and therefore all, um, always a corruption of the free will um, of of voters. So that would be a a second. Um, fundamental problem. A third fundamental problem is that oh, a saying of the sovereign or of any decision-making body should at any time be reversible by an act of the same quality or of the same level. Um, that does not hold true if you rely on the sort of on the veto power of a um, of, a, of a, a parliament or a head of government, um, uh, you cannot reconsider a decision you have once taken, which again is a sign that clearly you're somehow not entirely sovereign. Otherwise, you could say, well, I'm not so sovereign that I cannot come back to what I decided earlier on. I, I might come back at any time that I wish so. Mm. So the, clearly the referendum was a tool of the government or of, of parliament, right? And it kind of, it, it, it was not initiated from the people, so it was top down, not bottom up. And in our uh, principles, we say that actually di a direct democratic institution is an institution, a tool for the people to guide the political process, and that should be bottom up. And also, as you said, uh, the whether a decision taken by the people is reversible or whether the people can update their decision that was also clearly uh, lacking in in that in that whole process because we saw once the referendum was approved a whole new set of questions came up about the future relationship between the united kingdom and the european union and suddenly a lot more questions were on the table and the people kind of felt, well, we have taken that first decision. Maybe we should also have a say on further, dis uh, further decisions on the way. And obviously, the government didn't you know, allow a second referendum to happen, even though we saw in, in London uh, or across the United Kingdom, uh, there was a large part of the population who wanted a second vote, not mm -hmm. necessarily to reverse the decision, but to update the decision because suddenly people realized, oh, that relationship be between the United Kingdom and the European Union is very complicated and it involves a whole lot of um, contracts. So the people should also have a say on, on the future relationship. So, yeah, if you sort of build in that fundamental construction flaw into direct democracy, you end up with the ironic result that you promised a tool to, you know, enable the people to, have a, to directly voice their will, and then you end up with a result that is, you know, demonstrably not in the will of the majority, and yet the majority can do nothing um, about it. And there's a further problem um, which has to do with responsibility. So one of the great strengths of direct democracy is you cannot point to those in power for the troubles you're in um, or to a much um, um, smaller degree um, than you can in, in, in much more representative democracies. Um, uh, because to a degree you're responsible for the mess uh, yourself as as a um, as a people, but if you rely on uh, the um, the grace of a government um, to speak about something and the timing is determined by that um, government and whether you have a second say as well, uh, then you can still shift responsibility to um, the government and the government can shift responsibility back to the people and say, no, Brexit means Brexit. That's the, the sort of the, um, the mandate you gave us. Um, and, and, and there will be no clear um, uh, you know, allocation of responsibility. And that is 
a flaw in the in, in the design of institutions. Mm. And also the the whole process revealed that in the UK actually the parliament is sovereign and not the people because the people were you know asked only at a specific point in time what is their opinion on being a member of the European Union but they couldn't update that that opinion and and so also another aspect that we discuss in 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 that um blog post is is the single subject rule so that the the Brexit referendum was not only a decision over Uh, whether the United Kingdom should be a member of, should continue to be a member of the European Union, but it was also a um, a decision on whether people approve of David Cameron as a prime minister, right? So the people couldn't really um, express their will in an un, uh, unadulterated way, as we as we describe, because it was both a referendum on on the membership but also on the government yeah and that will always be the case as i said and never will a head of government um uh, initiate a referendum if he or she does not think that that improves uh you know their political elbow room uh so It will always be in situations where it is also a plebiscite on the future of a government that can be um, observed in the in, in the referendums that De Gaulle um, organized in France and m many other um, examples throughout history. So there's always a mix-up of issues and um, that alone makes this top-down version of direct democracy deeply flawed. And also it is used really by many kind of authoritarian rulers as a confirmation of their rule, right? So uh, it is often used to confirm changes in, in uh, constitutions that usually uh, concentrate the power in the, in the hands of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the authoritarian ruler and That also violates the single subject rule in the sense that if if an auto, uh, authoritarian ruler uh, has a referendum approved, he also it gives him legitimacy mm -hmm. in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. Which shouldn't be obviously on the ballot at the same time. So in a in a more authoritarian sense, uh, obviously the the referendum. Most, most often on, on changes in the constitutions that concentrate power in the hands of the executive government is often used as a, as a tool for legitimacy. Yeah, and as a tool to, um, um, you know, work the way of a government around checks and balances and to have, you know, a trump card um, against a um, apex court Uh, that would say, um, say, no, that is unconstitutional or that's not how we understand the constitution or against an opposition in parliament. So yes, um, once it is organized top down, then it can be a way to you know, concentrate power. And again, that is sort of a, a perverse effect um, against the, what, what one would think is the it intention of direct democracy to improve the control of power um, by people. I should add an important addendum to this um, bottom-up requirement. It is not meant to say that any issue that comes uh, to a referendum needs to be initiated bottom-up. It might fairly be that um, governments or parliaments sponsor bills or amendments as long as they don't have um, you know, discretion on whether it is brought before the people or not because there is a fixed rule like there is in Switzerland. If you do amend the constitution, you'll have to have a referendum no matter what um, and there's no elbow room to decide about that. Um, that is not a violation of the bottom-up um, principle. It is a violation as soon as you have discretion by the government or by parliament whether they want to 
um, put something to a referendum or not. Right. And maybe also discussing that the single subject rule again uh, from, from the voters' perspective, why is it so important that uh, a proposal put to the people or, or uh, an initiative or a referendum has that single subject that makes the will of the person who has to make the decision uh, uh, an unadulterated decision. Mm. Why is that so important? So the, the goal of direct democracy surely is to you know, in, um, have the, the least um, deformed voice of the people um, being put into law um, so th the goal must be to enable to everybody to as as clearly and as as um, as directly to to voice their true will um, and that is not possible if two or several issues are mixed up in one sort of box that you can tick uh, so that you say well I might want to say yes to some of these aspects but then no to others that is the first reason why you have to disentangle them um, otherwise sort of the, the, the specific goal of direct democracy might fail in a special case like in Switzerland where gathering a certain number of signatures is a requirement to um, have a referendum there's a second problem namely that you know you create um, inequality between different proposals if you allow one proposal to have several issues in it and therefore several different groups of potential supporters which makes it easier to gather the necessary um, signatures. So um, there's also the aspect of the equality among political competitors um, for, for initiatives. Right. And now I want to come back to the recent popular initiative that the Swiss voting population had to decide on. And that was the, the burqa or the, the niqab ban that essentially was a proposition to uh, prohibit people from covering their face or to have a face veil. Um, as in, in, in public spaces. And so that is a typical, I would say, typical example of a, a majority, which is, you know, the people who, um, in Switzerland, who obviously um, are, well, many are, are Christians or atheists and, and the, the, the very, very small population in Switzerland that actually wears uh, a niqab or a, a, a burqa, which are a few women, Muslim women mainly, or, yeah, we, we assume that. And that is kind of the tyranny of the majority against a very, very tiny minority. And how, how can we uh, prevent that in a... In a in a direct democratic institution, or what is the problem with it also? Well, there are several things to be said here. The first observation is that obviously you do not need direct democracy in order to have that sort of the tyranny of the majority since Switzerland is the last in a rather long series of European countries that have um, very comparable full face veiling bans and none of the previous examples was um, uh, you know um, originated in, in in direct democracy so clearly there are many ways in which uh, populism and the, you know the wish to um, exclude and, and suppress minorities can find its ways into into the law um, so uh, we you know, must not unfairly compare direct democracy um, to um, other democratic systems. Uh, um, a, a frequent um, flaw in criticizing direct democracy is that upon um, scrutiny, it turns out that people um, 
criticizing direct democracy are actually criticizing democ um, democracy um, uh, more generally um, because it can um, lead to such um, problematic um, result. Uh, another important thing I would like to point out, we've previously um, discussed the ban on minarets, which um, you know was important for my own um, politicization and was sort of a wake-up call in Switzerland for uh, a lot of civil society organizations. That um, vote was in 2009, um, so 11 years ago, um, and it was a much less attractive proposal than a burqa ban because its Islamophobia was, was even more rampant, even more obvious. Uh, there would be no one outside of the right-wing populist spectrum to support it, um, unlike with the burqa ban that has supporters in a feminist camp and in you know among uh, left-wing lightists and so on. So... You know, in comparison, the, the the ban on minaret should have um, um, should have um, had a much harder stance um, at the ballots compared to the um, burqa ban, and yet it was the other way around. Um, it was much more popular at the time than the burqa ban, which was won by a rather um, narrow margin, um, fifty one point two percent, and so that shows that. Without changing something about the institutional design of um, direct democracy, it is possible by a better organization of the civil society to do something against those very problematic tendencies of a tyranny of the majority. And that might be an important um, you know, reference to what I said at the very beginning, that direct democracy um, sort of... Um, uh, relentlessly, um, uh, you know, makes civil society reorganize and and um, improve its campaigning capacity and keeps it alert and awake um, to the threat of um, populist rules. Um, and I'm rather optimistic that that is what might have happened from the ban on minarets to the ban on burqas, and it's a pity that. Uh, we didn't make it, you know, across the line. Um, however, of course, the problem remains. There is undeniably a risk of um, the tyranny of the majority. Um, and it remains, that is also shown by the experience from last Sunday, notoriously difficult to insist in a system of direct democracy that majority is a necessary, not a sufficient condition for legitimate state power. So uh, checks of balances, l the limitation of state power, human rights as a counterweight to majority vote um, are extremely important um, in a system of direct democracy. And that, you know, in addition to a majority vote, you also need... Um, a principle of um, proportionality that is respected and a compelling public interest that you have to spell out so that you can interfere with the um, um, individual's fear of um, freedom um, remains something that is um, very difficult to um, in insist on in a system of, di of direct democracy. Um, but it is possible, and I am optimistic that, you know, in contexts outside of Switzerland where direct democracy sort of is created with less path dependencies than you're confronted with here in Switzerland, that you could build in securities um, uh, for the protection of individual rights against the tyranny of the majority that would actually work better than in Switzerland. And I think here in Switzerland, it, the progress that we've made in the short time that I'm uh, myself uh, an active witness of, policy, uh, of, of direct democracy um, are quite remarkable. Um, we can you know, discuss about how that worked. Mm, so we can clearly say that you know, minorities are always 
at risk to some degree, no matter whether we are in a representative or in a direct democracy or a combination of both, as, as in Switzerland. And um, that discussion just becomes, or that problem also becomes very visible in a direct democracy like Switzerland, right? So we see that the people have to, you know, defend uh, basic rights, have to protect minorities, the, there needs to be a strong deliberation among the population to, yeah, to really educate the people about all these issues, which is a lot of work. And unfortunately, this time it didn't quite get over the line as, as, as um, from our perspective, uh, intended. Um, so it has shown one, one more time that this discussion needs to be held constantly and, and the direct democracy in Switzerland is just a, um, a window into this, into this conflict uh, between the basic law, the tyranny of the majority and the protection of minorities. And you have, a, a, or yeah, in, in one of your pieces that you wrote, you have a specific suggestion of how minorities could be protected, right? In the sense that before, uh, or when a popular initiative is is uh, um, put to the people, that conflicts with basic laws need to be transparent and declared. Can you say something about? Or? Yeah. So it's a two pronged problem. Um, one is how do you deal with um, proposals in direct democracy that are in conflict with fundamental rights. And the other one is, and often they're overlapping, how do you deal with proposals that are in conflict with international law? And given that international human rights protection is an important field in um, international law, there's um, frequent overlap um, between the two. Um, and that has become a constant problem in Swiss direct democracy uh, since 2004. And um, given that it is the constitution that is amended, um, it, the, the conflict becomes even more um, delicate because um, fundamental rights are guaranteed in the constitution as well. And it's problematic to have you know, a, a hierarchy of norms within the constitution. Um, and it is problematic to argue that international treaties rank higher than even younger constitutional law. So there is, you know, white of legitimacy of the sovereign that has spoken um, becomes very um, difficult to, um, to, to, to argue around um, if you want. And my proposal would be rather, I think, um, an easy fix for both these problems, and that is that uh, either written or by a you know um, uh, constant practice of of parliament and and the government, um, one would install a you know a, 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 um, a, a pre um, supposition of um, the human rights friendliness of the people. So if it is unclear how the conflict between a new proposal and international treaties or um, human rights as guaranteed in the constitution um, are to be solved, then it is presumed that people wanted to, um, you know, um, have the new infringe on these rights the, right? that they did not want to infringe in um but that they did want to have you know the the new amendment um uh being executed within the frame that human rights and international law actually set and as long as they don't say specifically and specifically would mean in the amendment itself Otherwise, um, one would um, one would presume that something would be, you know, put into effect um, within um, the frame that human rights set, and so that means that a um, committee that wants to amend the constitution in violation of human rights would have to say so explicitly and uh, you know trust is that that would make a political project rather un 
attractive and that that would be you know an easy and elegant fix to the problem because switzerland is discussing this um issue for a long time and it turns out to be extremely tricky to sort of have a list of um of of rules that if they are violated or might be violated by a new um amendment to the constitution then the amendment will, will be sort of invalid and not being brought to the um, um to um to the referendum so no project of such a list has gone anywhere um, uh, or would have have any chance in a political process because of course it would have be um, it would have to be voted on as well and it's very unlikely that people would agree to sort of clip their own wings Mm. That that makes sense. So, wrapping up the discussion, I would like to know from you if you had the power as a, let's say, benevolent dictator in Switzerland, what rule would you change? First, uh, I would abolish the benevolent dictator. I think because, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, there is clearly no such thing as a be benevolent um, dictator. Power corrupts. It corrupts those in power and those who have to serve, which is why. Um, direct democracy is such a um, you know a thing worth fighting for. Um, I would I think change in Switzerland the rule um, so that it is the rules so that it is more explicit. It, there is a tendency towards thinking that way I described. So um, earlier, this this idea of a presupposition for the human rights friendliness of the people. I, if I sort of could rule for a day, I would look for ways of, inst you know, institutionalize that presupposition. I think that would be a healthy, you know, growing up for direct democracy in Switzerland. Cool. And can you recommend any book or any piece that um, y you think is, is, you know, very important to to know uh, regarding direct democracy, or or um, yeah, it could also be a, a various pieces that we can link on in the show notes. Um, several books I'd like to point to. We haven't spoken about populism specifically and about the notion of Verfassungspatriotism, so constitutional patriotism, the idea or the, the motivation to get into politics or into, you know, civic um, strive to defend and improve constitutional institutions. It's a very, you know, German um, concept of patriotism um, and one that we, um, the, the movement I helped to create, rely on as well. On both notions, there are lovely books written by Jan Werner Müller, um, one of them is available in English um, called What is Populism? The other one um, is entitled Verfassungspatriotismus and explains um, the concept. I can highly recommend both. Both were very important for my own work. Um, two other books that um, have been important to me in the past year is um, The Passage to Europe by Luke van Middeldaar, who, um, who explores the creation of the European Union and the role that democracy um, played in, um, in that um, evolution, especially referendums about um, quasi-constitutions of Europe. So that's a highly intriguing um, book, more specifically on the history of direct democracy in Switzerland. There's a book that came out last year written by Josef Lang. It's only in German. Um, Demokratie um, in der Schweiz, um, it's called, and you know, it emphasizes um, this uneasy tension um, between um, participation and the tendency to exclude others from participation. So it's written from a very, you know, partisan point of view, but a highly intriguing read on the creation of Swiss direct democracy. Cool. Thanks a lot for for sharing those. Um, uh, recommendations okay now i yeah let's let's end here we could go on for for hours probably discussing direct democracy and we also might do uh, a follow-up um maybe some applications of direct democracy across countries we we specifically wanted to talk about 
the more conceptual parts of direct democracy in, in this episode. But yeah, um, thanks a lot, Stefan. And Thank uh, you, Stefan. And uh, yeah, I would be very happy to have you on the podcast again. It would be my pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.